Try this again. Hopefully our connection is, is good. All right. Okay. All right. It's not glitching anymore. I'm going to get into it. Uh, so if you guys caught me over on Instagram, I re I'm really hoping to be able to kind of dual stream so that we'll be doing Instagram and YouTube together. I wanted to have that done for this week, but I did not have time to like figure it out. It's a little more complicated than I was expecting it to be. So I'm hoping to get all of that figured out and set up so that for next week, we will have like the whole dual streaming thing so I can be Instagram and YouTube at the same time and I don't have to cut anything short and we can just keep on going. Hi Paula, how are you? Is your snow about melted? Ours is about melted. Lavender Crowl here says they're just getting snow, but um, ours is about melted and I really hope winter does not show up, but you know, really it's January. So there's that's, that's a lot of winter left. <laughs> Hi Robin. That's a lot of winter left, so <clears throat> I don't think we're going to get out of it with, like, a couple weeks of bad snow and really cold temperatures, and that's it. But I'm really hoping, like, fingers crossed, I'm really hoping, because it's really nice being able to actually access our farm and not have to park on the road and haul in all of the water and supplies 300 feet. That's not fun. Mm. Snow is mostly gone. Getting the itch. Yeah, you and me both. Tomorrow we're gonna go out and we're going to lay out the rest of the garden beds in the homestead garden. And once that's done, I might actually add a few more. And once that's done, then I turn my attention to the farm. And I'm so excited because we gotta get the, the greenhouse space going and like, I'm so excited about it. So much to do. So, okay, <clears throat> let's get into this. I'm going to talk about breathing emergencies tonight. We're going to talk about the respiratory things that like you need to be able to do. You need to be able to have certain equipment on hand to be able to respond, react correctly so that, you know, outcomes can be better. Um, we're going to talk about skills you need to have. We're going to talk about herbs. I have a list herbs that are very helpful that can help you with your respiratory system and we're going to talk about when to go to the doctor versus when to use your herbs and things and then we're going to talk about kids which i know mostly here there's not tons of like young moms with young kids here but i know there's some grandmas and some grandpas that have um, young kids around. So these are important things to know, uh, no matter what part of life you are in. So let's get into it. Now I have talked a lot about breathing stuff here on YouTube before I've talked about doing, um, let's see, having, so I've talked about respiratory herbs. I've talked about, um, respiratory equipment and things like that, but we're just going to kind of put it all together here. And if you all, hi, Lavender Crowl, um, if you all have any questions at any point in time, just go ahead and pop in there. Don't feel like you're interrupting. Somebody, somebody sent me a message last week and was like, I wanted to ask questions, but I felt like I was interrupting. Uh, you're not interrupting. This is the whole point here. So I will finish what I'm saying and then I will comment on it. So yeah, jump in, jump in, jump in where you feel. Okay, so let's talk about equipment. <clears throat> so this is going to sound very, very, hi, Georgette. It's going to sound very like allopathic, okay? Um, and for anybody that doesn't know what allopathic means, it pretty much just means Western medicine. Like the modern conventional medicine side of things is what we call allopathy. Okay, so this is going to sound kind of allopathic at the beginning, but these are things that you need to have to be able to um, understand what's going on in the respiratory system and my nose is really itchy for some reason. I don't know why. So excuse me for constantly itching my nose. All right. Um, so these are things that you need to have on hand. <clears throat> so the very first thing, this is, this is whether you have any kind of respiratory issues or not. These are things that at some point in time, everybody could deal with. Uh, if you have COVID, if you have the flu, if you have bronchitis, if you have a cold that goes into your chest, like there's, there's times where it's going to be important for you to have respiratory equipment. So I'm going to list all of them and we'll go over them. So first one is a pulse oximeter. So a pulse oximeter is this little thing that you just like, I mean, it's like this long. Sometimes they're on rope. Um, 
you just put it on your finger. For women, if you have nail polish on, if you have acrylic nails, uh, especially the darker the nail polish, the worse it is, it is going to inhibit the reading. So it measures the oxygenation that is in your blood and you wanna have a good reading, that's very important. It also, um, it also reads the pulse. So in someone that is having a respiratory emergency and you're seeing that their pulse ox, like their blood oxygen is going down, you will often see that their pulse is high. So if you are getting like a wonky reading and you're just like, well, their pulse is like 75, but it looks like their oxygen is like 88, mm, could be a connection issue. So you want to like, look, look around, just make sure like, is it a nail polish, nail polish issue? Is it an acrylic nail issue? Um, I cannot speak to those like sticker nail polish things. I don't use them. And when I was a paramedic, that wasn't a thing yet. So I can't say how those interfere. I have no idea. Some things you can do. Oh, also if the nail, if your hands are cold, it can slightly alter the reading. So you just rub them, do this like even a degree or two makes a big difference. You can turn. So this little thing, there's a red light inside and one light should be on the top and then the bottom pad should be on the bottom and it reads your blood oxygen that way. You can turn it sideways. It's not as reliable, but it is an option. So if you're not getting a good reading there or you've got fake nails on or something, turn it sideways. But if you're going to do that, really, honestly, the thumb is better because it's a little squishier. There's a little more surface area there. Um, on babies or really small people or people that have like uh, maybe a partially amputated finger or something, um, or they don't have hands at all, you can put a pulse ox on the toes or on the ear in a, in a last ditch effort kind of a thing. You, This is not super ideal because like right now my ears are freezing, so it would not be really ideal uh, to put that on my ear. So there's not as much vascul vasculature in there, so there's not a whole lot of blood vessels compared to what's in the tips of your fingers and in your toes. So fingers first, toes second, ears third. Those are your options. With babies, just go straight for the big toe. Like we're talking little babies, like infants under six months years old, under six months of age, uh, you can do the toe because the thing, you know, they do this all the time, you know, and they're going to try and grab it and play with it, or they're going to be flailing if they're not feeling well, and you're just not going to get a great read and restraining them to try and get it increases their anxiety and it makes their breathing worse. And that's the last thing you want to be doing. So you've got your pulse oximeter, okay? You can get them off of Amazon. They're super cheap. And I can put links for everything, like Amazon links down in the description box. If you guys want that, let me know. Because if you don't want it, I'm not going to do it. Because um, it takes a minute to get all of those links and to put them in. But if you want them, I will absolutely do that. Uh, a nebulizer is your next thing that I think every household should have. You, you, you don't need to get one... Um, well, no, I'm not even gonna say that. I really think everybody should have one because you can use them for multiple different things. You can get them. Insurance in the States will pay for nebulizers. As far as I know, every uh, insurance in the States will pay for one with a doctor's order. So you can get them online. Excuse me, you can get them online. You can get them uh, through a medical supply store. I'm pretty sure with Amazon, you can get them on Amazon too, because now they're taking like HSA payments and things. So with some things, you know, with medically qualifying things. Um, so there's, there's options. You don't need a prescription and this is going to vary depending on where you're at. So that's going to depend on your state, sometimes your county, it depends on the area. It's going to depend on um, the store. If you walk into a medical supply store, some of them only deal with insurances and some of them are just like, we don't care. You don't have an insurance. It's just out of pocket. So it really just depends. There also are um, little handheld nebulizers that you can get. And for those that don't know, a nebulizer is a piece of equipment that you use to help uh, either treat the airway inflammation and airway that's closing or you can use a sterile saline with a nebulizer also that will also help 
um, kind of loosen up phlegm and congestion and things too. So people can do those too. Sometimes doing sterile saline um, treatments with a nebulizer can be very beneficial. It really just depends on what you're dealing with. And, and like if I did a sterile saline solution uh, treatment, it would do absolutely nothing for me. Absolutely nothing. Because um, I use albuterol. And actually, I, I use like what we call a duo neb. So it's got albuterol and a steroid together in there. So if you have um, a nebulizer, make sure you have a good, like a good healthy stock of albuterol treatments and make sure you have them on hand at all times. Don't go, hmm, I'm pretty controlled right now. I don't really need it. So I'm not going to fill it and I'm not going to have that on hand, especially since it's not the cheapest prescription in the world. It's definitely nowhere near the most expensive. It's moderate. Um, but it's almost always covered by insurance. All insurances. If you have state aid in any state, it is 100% covered. Albuterol sulfate, which is the only albuterol for a nebulizer, is 100% covered. If you have Medicare, it is 100% covered. Private insurances, you will have a deductible. But there are so many different options in the states for getting your prescription costs down that you should not have a problem getting your albuterol at all. But you need to always, 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 always keep a good healthy stock of albuterol just in case you need that. Um, if you have something chronic, always also talk to your doctor. You should be seeing a pulmonologist if you have issues with chronic respiratory issues, not just your primary doctor because they don't understand things on the level a pulmonologist does. And they're not going to treat you as efficiently. So you need to make sure you're seeing a pulmonologist. And you need to make sure that you have a standing order for steroids and you know how to use your steroids. Uh, maintenance inhaler is another thing that you need to have and what we call a metered dose inhaler. So a metered dose inhaler is just an inhaler. Okay, so you pump it. It's a metered dose. It's going to give you one dose and you breathe it in. Uh, and there's your, there's your medicine. Now your albuterol treatments and a nebulizer are way more potent than in a inhaler. Some people they'll take their inhaler and it doesn't do a whole heck of a lot. And then they'll go over to the nebulizer and they're good to go. That's me. I, I don't respond great to an inhaler, but put me on a nebulizer. I'm good. I'm, I'm feeling great. There are a lot of side effects with albuterol in a nebulizer and in, in an MDI, what we call a meter dose inhaler. There are side effects. Um, it mostly includes palpitations and you get real shaky. Like I, I, I jitter like this. It's, it's bad. It like you shake for a while and like your insides are shaking. Like you're, you feel like your organs are shaking. So um, little side effect, hydrate the crap out of yourself, take some electrolytes and eat some sugar. And that helps with that. Um, okay, so inhalers, albuterol, nebulizer, pulse ox, steroids, and a stethoscope. You need to have a stethoscope. Not crazy about inhalers. Neither am I. I don't like them. I don't like treatments either. I'd rather take an inhaler than do a treatment uh, because I, just, I really hate being hooked to that machine. Um, and I really hate how I feel afterwards. But breathing, you know, it's necessary it's it's important so and and i'm going to say this now while it is fresh in my brain or i will forget later um if you feel if you have asthma and you are feeling symptoms you need to know how to identify your very first warning sign okay like for me it's when i swallow and i feel like i have a lump in my throat that is my warning your asthma is starting to flare, you better do something about it now. And if I react immediately, if I respond immediately to that, I can get it under control. And I don't even need to sit on a, uh, on a nebulizer or anything. I can, sometimes I can use herbs and sometimes I can just take an inhaler, like one to two puffs of an inhaler and I'm good. And I don't need to go in and take out the equipment, take out the nebulizer or go home from wherever I'm at and go home and, and take that. And then I'm, I'm done for the day. So I don't want to, I don't want to deal with that. Some family members and Hubby's family have asthma. Yeah. So parent, unfortunately, it is hereditary. So if someone in your family is predisposed to having asthma, if you have kids, there is a higher likelihood that they can have asthma too. Now, the, the good and bad things about childhood asthma, one, it's really scary. Uh, but two, if they have childhood asthma, like when they're younger, 
a lot of kids grow out of it as they are an adult and their lungs mature, they can grow out of it. Um, but I will tell you, if your lung, if your asthma is uncontrolled, it's doing damage to your lungs. And if you don't keep it under control, you don't have an opportunity for healing. So that's why it's important to not wait until you're severe, to not wait until you feel like, okay, now I'm really in trouble. Don't do that. If you feel like you're coughing, like you have a lump in your throat, if you feel like you're constantly having to clear your throat, these are all warning signs for asthma that the pulmonologist or your primary doctor will not tell you. They don't, they don't, they don't think to tell you that. They just go, well, if you're having a hard time breathing, but they don't think to go like, a lot of people don't realize what a hard time breathing is. If you are constantly clearing your throat, yawning, yawning is a big one for me. Yawning, if you are constantly yawning and you just feel like you, now I'm gonna yawn. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I talked about it. <laughs> All right. So if you're yawning a lot, if you're coughing, if you're clearing your throat, um, <clears throat> if you're clearing your throat a lot like that, um, if you are, what's another one? This sound <clears throat> like that, like you just feel like you have to move stuff. Um, now we all are. <laughs> Sorry, I made everybody yawn. Um, so if you're doing any of that, like constantly, if you're doing that a lot, those are all asthma signs. People don't get that. Heartburn, if you get constant heartburn and then you start getting that lump in your throat, do you know how many people with asthma have heartburn and they don't realize that when they have a flare of their heartburn, it flares their asthma also? Asthma and heartburn are strongly related. So if you have asthma and you have heartburn, if you focus on your heartburn and you get that under control, you get your digestion in check, a lot of your asthma symptoms can go away. So, all right, stethoscope is the last piece of equipment. My daughter has all sorts of stuff out here. All right, um, a lot, didn't know, now you know. Um, that's why we're here. So the stethoscope is the last thing. Now, you do not need to get a pricey stethoscope, but you do need to have a stethoscope. You need to know how to use your stethoscope. The best thing that I tell people to do is go on YouTube and just search breath sounds through a stethoscope. You need to listen to what clear sounds like. You need to listen to what wheezing sounds like, what strider sounds like, especially if you have kids. That's a kid thing. Um... Uh, rails, especially if you have um, any kind of heart condition. Ronchi is another one. Rails and ronchi have more have to do with fluid that are in the lungs. You, oh, diminished breath sounds or absent breath sounds. You need to hear those. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about them. So rails and ronchi I talked about, that's more of a fluid thing. And uh, it has to do with like, when you inhale, you hear one thing. When you exhale, you hear another thing. And it sounds a lot like, it's gonna sound gross. <sighs> Like, it sounds like that. Like, you've got something, you're gargling like something, but it's in the lungs, okay? It, it is literally fluid that is in the lungs that cannot come out. Um, very common in patients that have uh, uncontrolled congestive heart failure. And uh, there's a number of other conditions that can cause that too. Um, let's see, strider and wheezing. Okay, so there's the big things. Wheezing is like this whistling sound that you hear on exhalation. So when somebody is breathing out, you'll hear <laughs> that kind of sound. Uh, sounds a little different because I'm like forcing it. Um, pneumonia, you can have that rail sound with pneumonia too. Yes, you absolutely can. Um, you can also have wheezing. You can have strider in a kid. You can have that. Strider is when you hear that when they're breathing in. So strider is more of an like up here kind of a thing. That is everything is closing up, wheezing, everything is closing up, but it's more in here, uh, which is your, like, all of the, I'm not going to get all into all of the anatomy, but like the parts of it is like your upper, so the parts of your respiratory system, your sinuses, your mouth, your throat is all included in your respiratory system, okay, and then you've got these little, they're like tubes, so you've got like your trachea here, and then you've got your, what starts with your bronchial tubes here. And then you've got it like branches out. So it looks like a tree. And then all the way at the bottom, you have your alveoli sacs. And those, if you've ever had like a pneumonia or if you, if you had COVID pneumonia, this is, this is, is bad with COVID pneumonia. Um, the little sacs down at the bottom that are responsible for 
oxygen exchange, like oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange, they can close shut. And if they close shut, you got to get them open. And you do that by taking a lot of deep breaths. If you guys don't, I'm going to teach you how to breathe. If you guys don't know how to do what's called four square breathing and you have chronic respiratory issues, you need to learn how to do four square breathing because it's, it's life changing. Okay. Four square breathing is you breathe in for a count of four through your nose. You hold it for a count of four and you blow out for a count of four. Now, when you are breathing, you don't breathe up here. You don't go. Okay. So that all the air is going here. When you breathe in, breathe in with your diaphragm. Okay. Breathe in so that your stomach is moving out. So here's the difference. That's breathing up here. <coughs> Make myself cough. And then down here, do you see that? Like how my hands went out? that is how you should be taking a deep breath. If you're trying to take a deep breath up here and you still feel like you're not getting enough air, you're not breathing efficiently. So very, very important that you are focusing on how you're breathing if you're having any kind of emergency, like if you're in pneumonia or bronchitis or if you've got asthma, super important if you've got asthma, COPD, something like that. I heard that with my aunt yesterday when I saw her in the hospital. Which one? The the rails? Cause you can hear rails. If if rails are bad, sorry, she's in the hospital, by the way. Um, if you you can you can hear rails in your lungs um, audibly, like without a stethoscope, if they're bad, and that's not good. I do that every night. You do what every night? You have rails every night. Can you clear that though? Because if you can't clear that, please see your doctor. Okay, so make sure you are looking up a YouTube video, seeing how to use a stethoscope. You don't need to spend a lot of money. If you've got a heart condition, like congestive heart failure that we we're talking about, if you've got asthma, if you've got little kids, you can get a better, better quality stethoscope. Like the best ones are called Littmans. They're pricey. I have a Littman because I was paramedic. So I have a really good high quality stethoscope, but they're like $250 plus. And the, um, the lower quality ones, they still do the job like they're fine. I've been to plenty of doctors that are using like the cheap disposable stethoscopes because it's what they have on hand. Or they'll use kind of like a middle of the road one, which is like a dual head stethoscope. So on one side, you've seen the stethoscopes where it's like, you know, the normal stethoscope that they use on everything. And then they will turn it. If you go to the cardiologist, they this is a cardiology stethoscope. Um, they'll turn it. And then there's a little head on the other side. You can use that to listen to the heart. You can also use that to listen to babies and toddlers, like younger, smaller lungs. Okay, so you can use it for that too. So I always make sure, say, make sure that you have those when you have little kids too. All right, skills. Let's talk about skills here. It's already 730. <laughs> All right, so skills that are important. You need to understand the breath sounds you need to know how to use all of all of this equipment. If you don't need to, if you don't know how to use your equipment, this doesn't, or, or your herbs, okay? It does nothing for you. Your equipment are is only as good as the person using it. Um, you need to know CPR. Please learn CPR if you, um, if you don't. There are a number of places that you can do it, that you can learn it. There's a lot of like tricks to remembering CPR and like they make it a little more fun, you know, learning it, learning it for what it is. Um, you're learning it for a purpose. And nowadays when they're saying like lay person or civilian CPR, they're, they're, they're saying like really respirations are not even the most important thing anymore. It's just doing compressions. So now they change CPR constantly because they're finding things are more effective or less effective. So it really just depends. But that's why it's important that if you did CPR, a CPR class and got certified 10 years ago, it's time to redo it. It's time to redo it because it's totally different to take CPR as a civilian um, where things are constantly changing versus if you're taking it as a medical provider, you've got machinery and things that are breathing for them. And though there are still some changes within that field, it's not it's not quite the same. It's it's different. We have different certifications, things, but make sure you stay up to date on your CPR. Um, identifying cyanosis. Okay, so cyanosis is turning blue. Oh, you lost me for a second and you couldn't. Oh, okay. I lost you for a second and couldn't respond when you first asked. No, not me. I'm good. I meant I do the breathing over. Oh, the four square breathing. All right, good, good. Um, Cyanosis is when someone is not getting good oxygen exchange down at the base of their lungs and they are turning blue. 
So you will see a little bit of a blue tinge on their lips. We're not talking about like blue, blue, okay? They're not turning blue. They're, it's like this bluish color. Um, it can be bluish purplish when it's really bad. Uh, it, their skin can start turning gray if it's really, 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 like if they're about to stop breathing. Um, or once they've stopped breathing, here comes the train. Um, their nail beds can also turn bluish and they will also get cold because if they're not having good oxygenation, they're also not getting good perfusion. So perfusion has to do with the blood. So if you're, if their blood is still pumping fine, but they're not oxygenated, they don't have oxygen rich blood because that gas exchange hasn't happened how it should, then their perfusion is suffering. So they're not getting oxygen to all the parts of the body. And you will start to see that in the lips and in the hands, the fingernails, your toenails will start turning bluish color. So you need to be able to identify the emergent signs. And so that's skills, breath sound, CPR, using your equipment, identifying cyanosis, being able to identify the emergencies. And the last identification thing we're going to talk about has to do with kids. And I'm going to talk about that last because a lot is different with kids. Let's talk about herbs now. Let's talk about what we want to talk about here. I'm going to talk about five different herbs and I did a whole YouTube video on this and I got deep into all five of them. So when we're done here, I will link that video down there in the description box. You guys can check that out. It is all about the, the herbs that I use regularly to support the respiratory system. Now there are a lot of herbs that can have quite a few benefits for the respiratory system. <clears throat> But these five I find to be the most beneficial pretty much across the board with most people. Now, again, if you're going to use different herbs for different things, you need to make sure that you are doing your own research to make sure nothing is contraindicated for you. There are some herbs, um, you know, out there that if you have liver issues or if you have kidney issues or some people just might have an allergy to if they're allergic to that class of plant. So you just need to make sure that you're doing your research. A quick search is all it takes or looking in the herbal books, which is the preferred method, okay? <laughs> Getting yourself a good herbal library is the most preferred thing. Mullen is the first one I'm gonna talk about. Mullen is a respiratory tonic herb. Um, if you hear anybody say tonic, that means something that they can take daily for a long period of time without any kind of wonky side effects or anything. So Mullen is a really great tonic herb for the lungs. It helps to build the lungs back up. It helps to restore balance. Uh, it's very, very supportive and very, very good for the lungs. Now, Mullen is a big plant, right? In the first year, Mullen, I also have multiple videos on Mullen. I can put all those down there too. Um, mullen in the first year is like a rosette, okay? It grows real close to the ground. It just kind of like grows out like that. It can get pretty big, uh, but the, the younger flowers are the most ideal ones to harvest and, or not flowers, leaves. The younger leaves, <laughs> the smaller ones, not the super tiny ones, but like the ones that are a little farther out, not the center of the rosette, but a little bit farther, not the big ones that are like paler and like kind of, they look like they're pretty spent. You want the ones in the, in like the middle there that are younger, those are the most medicinally potent and they have the most beneficial properties for your lungs. There in the second year mullein, it shoots up that stalk. You don't want those flowers, okay? That is not for the respiratory system. That is for your ears. Some people use them for other things too, but I say keep it to the ears. And that's just my own, my own personal, okay? That's how we use it. And then the roots are very specifically for lower inflammatory back pain. And we use those in a tincture. But the leaves you use in tea. You do not want to use mullein leaf in a tincture. You want to use mullein leaf in a hot, okay, or a standard infusion, which is a hot tea. All of these herbs that I'm going to talk about that you can use in a tea, there's one that you, you should not use in a tea. You should use it as a tincture. We'll talk about it in a minute. Um, you should be drinking these as warm as possible because for two reasons. One, they just work better in your lungs. Um, as you're swallowing that, every, as you're getting that in there and everything's warm, it just it works better and it feels so much better when you're drinking that as warm as you safely and comfortably can. Um, the other reason is when you are drinking your cup of respiratory tea, breathe that sucker in. So sit there with your cup and stick your face in the cup 
and breathe all of those vapors in, all of that steam in because medicinal properties transfer into steam as well. So you want to breathe all of it in. So you're doing like a dual purpose kind of a thing. Keep like a tissue or a handkerchief or something on hand because things happen, okay? Drainage happens. Uh, so you wanna make sure you've got something there too. So Mullen, excellent for helping to, you can take it as a tonic to help maintain uh, lung health, respiratory health, and really helps to build the lungs back up to help support the healing if you are dealing with something chronic or something acute. So acute would be like the cold, the flu, um, bronchitis, pneumonia, something like that. Hyssop. I love hyssop. I love growing hyssop. I love smelling hyssop. It's, it's just a wonderful herb. So hyssop is not a tonic herb. Um, hang on. What did you say? You have some dried mullein. Awesome. Yes, hang on to that mullein. It's fabulous. Use that up. What about breathing in the moisture of a tea? Yeah, so that's what I was talking about. You're breathing in that vapor. Yes, all you want to definitely breathe that in. Um, oh, and you know what? Before I jump ahead into hyssop, you can also, let's see, mullein, hyssop, and we're going to talk about nettle and plantain also with these are four of the ones that you can put into a tea. You can also combine those and put it into an inhalation. So you would take boiled tea, so take your kettle, your whistling kettle, put it into a big stainless steel pot or, you know, whatever you got on hand. I, I would not use plastic. Um, and then put in your herbs, get a big towel over. You want to totally cover yourself and the bowl and just breathe that in. Again, have some tissues because things are going to happen. Okay, so back to hyssop. So hyssop is kind of considered the help all kind of herb when it comes to the respiratory system. It's beneficial with any type of respiratory um, symptom that you could have. It's, it can be beneficial. Now you don't want to use hyssop for a long period of time. It's more suggested to use for a shorter period of time, like for, you know, a few weeks or so. Now me personally, I use it for longer than I probably should, but it's because it's so beneficial for me. I want to make sure that I have it in my system for the entire season. What is in my eye for the entire season that tends to bother me? So that's winter. So I take it through most of winter. Right now I'm not taking it. Um, even being sick, because I'm taking my elecampane tincture, I'm okay. I don't. So I don't need the hyssop. But if I feel like I am needing it, then I absolutely will add it. Um, I did drink the hyssop yesterday, though, I have to say, because I made like a Franken tea. <laughs> I made, I should put that as like a short on here. Um, I did it as a reel on Instagram. But it was like, I took everything from my breathe tea. I took my sleep tea because I needed to sleep so bad. Um, and what else did I do? I took my, oh, and also my throat coat tea because my throat was really hurting. And I picked out all the elderberry because I can't have elderberry. Um, and I put all that together and then I added some rose hips. I made a Franken tea. Um, it was so many herbs, but it was, it was really, really good. And I think I'm going to make some more minus the hyssop tonight because it was so good and it was actually easier to sleep for the time that I did sleep last night so okay anyway derailing but hyssop is very very good for helping to break apart the junk that's sitting in your lungs so when you've got um, a sinus infection that is starting to like you know how like when you wake up in the morning if you have a sinus issue or even just like some seasonal congestion and it drains into your throat and it starts to settle into your lungs, take yourself some hyssop. So hyssop helps, that expectorant property in hyssop helps to break all that junk up to make it easier for you to cough out. That is my favorite thing that hyssop does. Of all of the things that hyssop does, it is my favorite. It is really, really good for helping to clear the crud that is hanging out and sticking into your lungs. Elecampane is the next one I'm going to talk about, and that one does an even better job. So hyssop and elecampane work a little bit differently. So like hyssop is really good for like clearing all this crap that's kind of sitting in here. Elecampane is good for everything. It like clears it out. We call that one the Robitussin of the herbal world. So if you ever taken some Robitussin and it's just like, whoa, all of this stuff is like coming out of your lungs, elecampane does that like that. It is so fast acting. So we don't take that as a tea because it is a root herb. We are we don't use the 
aerial parts of it. It's this big, beautiful, gigantic herb. And now my garden plans are like stuck in my head. And I can't wait to see like this whole hedge of elecampane. I hope it, I hope it all grows well this year. But we go after the roots in the winter of the second year. So the roots are really, really great if you tincture them and you have this wonderful, wonderful tincture that just like, you can put that in a little shot of water and it just, within a couple minutes, you're just like, oh, I can clear this up. This is no big deal and it's so easy. So if you have any kind of chronic breathing issues, like if you have asthma and and in, in you're struggling or you have a little a little viral something or whatever if you have some kind of illness going on and it's making it worse um the ella campaign like you know how exhausting it is to try and clear that out okay the ella campaign thins it so it is really easy to clear it out it's it is it is i love taking my ella campaign um, what about drainage coming down from the ear tubes? My hubby still gets that off and on since he had COVID. Um, so ears from drainage from the ears. Hmm. So there are some things that you can do. And you know what? If you want to send me a message, we can talk about some different things because I, I would ask some extra questions too with that. Um, and we can talk about that privately. But there's there's herbs that you can take. Like if there's a lot of issues with like extra moisture basically in the body, there's some drying herbs that you can take that can help just kind of like balance that. So you're not having all of that constantly because here's the thing is it's not necessarily most likely. And I don't, I don't know him. I've never like seen him before. I don't know the whole situation there, but it's very rare that it's just drainage from the ears. Usually it is sinus related and the sinus, the ears and the throat, like ENT, okay? It's like ear, nose, throat. All of that is related. So usually it's the sinuses. And if it is the back part of the sinuses where you feel like behind your eyes and the top of your forehead and in here, I'm willing to bet all of this feels like either tight or tense or congested in him that it's not just his ears. Um, not out of the ear, but yeah, down on the inside. Yes, because the, the eustachian tubes, is that what they're called? <laughs> I think so. The Those tubes that go, they're in the ear, they drain to the back of the throat. So if he's having pressure and things in here and he's having a buildup in here, he may not be retaining it in his sinuses, but it'll drain to the ears and then drain to the throat. And then he could have that post-nasal drip as he works in the morning. Um, and that'll be coming from the back of the sinuses down into the throat. So sinuses are a little bit different, but there are, there are some things that you can definitely do. Um, so yeah, we could talk about that a little more if you want. You could either shoot me an email or you can DM me on Instagram. Either one is fine. Um, nettle. Let's talk about nettle. So nettle is, I like to pair this one with Ella campaign also in my respiratory um, tincture that I take daily. I do elecampane nettle and goldenrod is my other one for other reasons, but elecampane it's, it's for allergy stuff. So if you're like allergic asthma, that's a really nice combo combination, elecampane nettle and goldenrod together. Nettle, fabulous for inflammation, right? I talk, I sing the praises. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, I might have to jump off here in a minute. It's my son calling. All right, <laughs> I may have to cut this short, guys. If he calls one more time, I'm gonna have to answer that. Um, nettle is very, very good for lowering inflammation. So for anti-inflammatory stuff, very, very, very important herb. Um, you can have allergies to nettle, okay? This is stinging nettle we're talking about. Nettle varies geographically, like whatever kind of nettle I'm thinking of is stinging nettle. That's what we have everywhere. But where you live, it could be deadhead or dead nettle, purple dead nettle. Um, there's lots of different kinds. So there's the one that we're talking about is stinging nettle. That's the one that you're lowering the inflammation like that. Prop the properties in stinging nettle are multi-beneficial. It's very nutritive for your body. Like it's really good for asthma and allergies. There's lots and lots of studies on it. And um, it's really fabulous for just systemic inflammation for helping um, to keep that down. 
So nettle is just kind of like that extra supportive herb. So if you have a lot of inflammation related to your respiratory system, great one to herb, not gonna hurt you unless you have a specific reaction to it and it's safe to take daily for a long time. The last one I'm gonna talk about is plantain. So plantain is not a respiratory herb per se, uh, but if you are around wildfire smoke, and I'm mentioning this now because virtually like all of the states and Canada this year had a really bad wildfire year. The smoke was thick and really concentrated in a lot of areas, especially in areas where we don't normally have it. So um, we had a lot of days here that were like in the red and in the purple on the maps. And we couldn't even walk outside without wearing a respirator, wearing masks regularly. And it, it made things very challenging. We couldn't go to market some days because the air quality was really bad. Yeah, for 23, it was, it was, it was awful. It was really awful this year or last year. See, I keep saying this year, it was bad. So um, plantain has this astringent property, this vulnerary property, and it helps to kind of knit all of the little micro tears and things in the lungs. It helps to pull them back together. Um, I felt bad for you. Yeah, it was rough. It was rough. Now, and it wasn't the worst here in, in Illinois either. It was really, it was bad. Don't get me wrong. And, um, it was way worse than we have ever had in my memory of living here, but it was awful. It was really, really bad. Um, and you know, we're super rural. Okay. Like there's one stoplight in our whole County. We are super rural and we don't have air quality issues unless it's harvest. And then you've got all of that GMO dust, which we're not even gonna go there, but all of that is in the air. And that's our time of year where we're like, yeah, we're not going outside or we have to wear a mask or whatever. Um, but it was like that the whole season. So you couldn't get away from it. And it was coming into the house, even with filters and like we have window air conditioners, which is better. But um, even with changing things out, keeping things super clean, it was still really, really, really hard to keep, you know, to keep away from it. So you get, when you have smoke inhalation of any kind, you get these little micro tears in your sinuses, in your mouth, in your throat, in your lungs, and you constantly have that heavy feeling. That's what that is. That's inflammation and those little tears, those little damages happening to those soft tissues. So plantain in that, and those properties that he had that I mentioned, it helps to kind of pull everything together and promote healing. That's how plantain works on the skin also with like cuts, bites, stings, scrapes, all of those things. It does it on the inside too. So it's really, really good for you. We had our worst fires too, but didn't get bad enough in our location to wear a mask. Well, that's, that's good and bad. Glad you didn't have to wear a mask, but yeah, it was a bad year for fires. I'm really hoping and praying that this year we don't have that issue. All right, let's talk about, I'm going to come through these. Um, these pretty quick here because I need to call my son back and see what was going on. Um, when to go to the doctor. Love plantain. Yes, me too. Oh, can mullein leaves in oil be used topic? I'm um, it says typically, but I'm gonna assume you said meant topically for skin issues. Yes, absolutely. Mullein is good. We actually make a mullein soap that is really good too. Um, so if you are having a hard time breathing and all of your bags of tricks. So like if you have a buterol, if you're doing, you can do like steam in the shower or cold outside or sticking your head in the freezer to help get that inflammation down, um, particularly in children that have croup. So croup is that barking seal cough. Uh, uh, there's no way I can mimic it. It, it really sounds like a seal barking. Um, and there's, it has kind of like this sliding scale where a, a little bit of it is that like, <coughs> You know, kind of like you heal hit that little bit of a bark to it, that really kind of tight cough coming through there. Um, and then the extreme of it, it literally sounds like a seal barking. Um, so look that up. Croup cough. That would be another thing that you can listen to on YouTube because it is not, it's not like, a, oh, well, my kid kind of sounds like this. And my, no, it is a very, this is a croup cough. You, once you hear it, you will always remember it. Uh, how you deal with croup is you do hot steam and cold, dry air, and you alternate. So first you go into the bathroom, super thick, lots of 
turn on that hot water, open the curtain and breathe in the steam. Like you don't get in the shower. Don't get in the shower because you're going into the cold air afterwards, but you breathe in that steam. Good. Do that for a good couple minutes. And then it's straight outside. If it's winter, it, colder, the better. Okay. And because what's happening is like all of that is getting kind of soft and pliable. And then you're going outside and that cold burst of air, it like immediately has this anti-inflammatory response because in croup, it is a, most of the time, it can be a bacterial kind of a thing, but like nine times out of 10, it is a viral infection and it causes a lot of fast, severe inflammation. And in some kids, it can make them stop breathing because it, it is closing everything off. Okay. And it's like throat, upper respiratory sinuses, like you're having that whole issue. Do not lay them flat. You need to keep them sitting up. You need to try and keep them calm, give them popsicles to suck on to keep everything cold. Steam, cold air, steam, cold air. You go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. It takes a long time, but you do that. If your kid, oh, and if it's not winter, stick their, I'm not kidding, like don't stand in front of the freezer, stick their heads into the freezer. We use our deep freezer, their head like go in and I just do this so that they're breathing in the cold air into the deep freezer. That's very, very important. Um, cold, like if you're doing like a cold mist humidifier, that's not, that's good for like while they're sleeping, but that steam is not going to have the effect that hot steam from the shower is going to have. Okay. So that's not a substitute. Uh, and then make sure a, a lot of doctors treat this with steroids. So if it's a severe case, you are going to want steroids. If it is something that it's not severe and you're getting through it just fine, they're okay with doing like you're getting it under control and they're breathing comfortably and they don't have any kind of retracting, which we'll talk about in a minute. A lot of the times you can just treat it at home and wait it out. But this is something you want to touch base with your doctor. Um, sometimes they'll decide like mm, you need a steroid to get this under control because it's too severe. And then you make your decisions from there. But in those kinds of situations where it's severe, you do not want to mess around with herbs too much. Okay. It takes time for herbs to work in a lot of cases. Now we talked about the Ella campaign works really fast and taking a breathe tea, drinking a breathe tea is very soothing and very helpful, but herbs work a when they're in your system and b better when they're in your system for longer. So herbal, you know, using herbal medicine is a long game. Okay. So this is something that you are using to promote healing. You can absolutely have instant effects with a lot of herbs, but there's also certain situations where it's time to stop with like, no, we're going to do everything natural and you are going to go to the doctor. And I am never going to be that herbalist that is going to tell you, hey, if you're going to the doctor, then it's because you are just not doing this right. I am never going to tell you that ever. You will never hear that here. I believe that allopathic medicine, so that's Western medicine, conventional medicine, and herbalism work best together. There is a time and a place for both. And when you are in an emergency situation, it is time to get your butt to the emergency room. It is not time to screw around with herbs, okay? You can do both. And in today's day and age, like I'm finding more and more, a lot of doctors are very supportive with herbs. Um, the only time at this point in time that I will get pushback is when I'm saying, I don't want to take that medication. I'm gonna take my herbs instead. And the doctors are not educated on it. So I'm finding that more and more. Um, I still get some eyes rolled, mostly from nurses. <laughs> but I'm finding that more and more. Now, I haven't been in the doctor's office as much lately either. So, you know, and, and it's my area too. And I've been established with my doctors for a good long while. But I'm about to start with a new rheumatologist because mine retired. So We'll see what happens there. That'll be exciting. And my pulmonologist does not understand herbs. So when I'm telling him I don't want to take that medication because I'm taking this, and after a while I'm going to see this, um, he doesn't believe me and he has to see it. So I just go, okay. And if he wants to write the prescription, I let him write the prescription. Sometimes I will fill it. Sometimes I won't. We'll keep it on hand if we do. Um, but then I go back and I go, he's like, oh, you're doing better. Yes, because I did what I wanted. See how that works? So, um, yeah, it's an opportunity for education. Okay, but if there's no improvement with what you are doing or if it is severe, don't screw around with the herbs, just go to the emergency room. And that brings me to kids. So 
Kids are a whole different beast. Kids will go from looking fine to not breathing like that. They are scary. Um, and they will do what's called decompensating very, very quickly. So there's a couple warning signs, okay? It's not just like, oh, they're fine and now they're dead. It's not like that. There's warning signs. So there's things that they do. Remember we talked about your entire respiratory system from your sinuses all the way down to the bottoms of your lungs. There's signs in all of this, okay? Especially in kids. One of the big ones you'll see first is flaring nostril. Okay, I'm gonna do them all. Flaring nostril. So you will see this. You'll see them doing that while they're breathing. Kids that take a pacifier or are drinking a bottle, you'll see this happen a lot because they'll be doing and you'll see that, okay? Sometimes it's labored breathing, which just means like, like they're working hard to breathe or they're breathing fast. Sometimes it's um, agonal. So it's like, like there there's pauses in between their breathing. Um, sometimes it's super congested, so it's really hard for them to do that. So it's hard to kind of judge what they're doing. So that's why there's other signs that you're going to look for. So there's something called accessory muscles. And these are all the muscles that are related, that are going to work really hard, that are going to be really pronounced. And that's your warning sign that you need to go to the hospital, um, or get to the doctor. Okay. Usually hospital. So this is going to look weird. Okay. So there's muscles in your neck. This is what it looks like. Okay. See these here? If you start seeing these when your kid's breathing or your grandchild is breathing, that's an emergency. We don't call the doctor and go, so my kid's breathing. No, you go to the ER. You need to go to the ER. Likewise, if they are retracting, if they are retracting and you don't have any meds on hand, you need to go to the ER. They need some intervention. They either need an albuterol treatment. They need they might need some steroids. They might need something else, a combination of things. They need something and they need it very quickly. So retractions look like so like the spaces in between your lungs um you can see okay you've got like a rib here rib here this space in between that's your intercostal space so when a kid is having a really hard time breathing and they breathe in this will suck in and you will see a rib and a rib and this blank space here because that is sucked inside okay that is retractions if your kid has retractions that is the ER immediately. Now they can be having retractions and still be, you know, driving their little cars around. They can be having retractions and still be snuggling with mom trying to go to sleep. That's because kids can have retractions and they're like working really hard to breathe and get really, really tired really, really fast. Or they can be having a hard time breathing. Um, they can be okay and then go from okay to having a hard time breathing to retractions to not breathing so fast. And it like doesn't seem like it registers in them. That's why we have things like pulse oximeters and things like that to check their oxygenation. So going back to that real quick, your oxygenation stats should be between 95 and 100%. If it's between 90 and 95, that's not good. If it's under 90, that is an absolute emergency, unless you've got another condition underneath, like, or, you know, that's underlying um, where that's normal for you. And then you have a conversation with your doctor talking about um, what your action plan is. Like, when do you go to the hospital? And if you've got a kid that has chronic issues, then you absolutely need to have an action plan, especially because a lot of ERs, especially if they don't have a pediatric section of an ER, then they're lumping their peds in with the adult doctors and the adult doctors don't know crap when it comes to treating kids most of the time. And that's, that's hospital across the board, by the way, like, doesn't matter if you're in Chicago or if you're in, you know, little town in Iowa, it doesn't matter. Um, adults and uh, kids are not little adults. Kids are a totally different beast. And most ER doctors are not proficient in pediatrics, okay? So um, you need, but but if they see a kid struggling to breathe and you're pointing out they have retractions, they're using their accessory muscles and this is what's going on, then they will, it, you tell them like they need treatment. Um, they won't mess around because they're scared of kids stopping breathing. They're scared of it. So they they will not mess around. My daughter suffered from asthma while a child. We had many trips to the doctor. I wish I had known all of this then. Yeah. Unfortunately, the doctors are not really good at explaining all of this. That's why you go to a, a pediatric pulmonologist. A pediatric pulmonologist is good at this. This is their specialty. 
Um, it may seem very cut and dry, like, oh, asthma, you take an inhaler. It, it is more complex than that. It is way more complex than that. And there's way more warning signs and there's way more things that can pop up that um, you don't even know is an issue and you don't know how to deal with it until now it's a chronic big thing that you're going to the doctor constantly for and you're in and out of the, uh, the emergency, I said operating room, emergency room constantly, or you're constantly on steroids and your medications don't work. Like there's, if all, any of that stuff is happening, you need to either get another doctor or get your doctor on board with a different kind of treatment. Um, a pulmonologist is like worth their weight in gold. A good pulmonologist even a crappy pulm. Like right now, my pulmonologist sucks. I had a great one and then he moved. And then the guy that came in, he's only there part-time because rural medicine. Um, and he's an idiot. <laughs> he just, he's like, oh, well, you just need this. And, you know, then he started with the, well, you know, you just need to lose weight. I'm like, dude, if you tell me I just need to lose weight one more time, I'm going to throat punch you. Like, <laughs> not really. You know, it just, it makes you want to say it. And it was so bad. Like the nurse came in and she's like, I will hit him for you. <laughs> she actually said that to me. I was like, no, because I need you to work here. I need you to not get fired and arrested. So I need you here to advocate for me. So don't do that. She's like, I'm going to get you what you need. I was like, awesome. You're awesome. <laughs> she's fabulous, but um, he's an idiot. I love that I found, <laughs> Paula is laughing at me. <laughs> I love that I found an herb uh, YouTuber who knows real doctor terminology. I like, I agree, like you said on another video, that they go hand in hand, but most times we don't need prescriptions. You, yeah, a lot of the stuff you don't, um, but it, it really depends what it is. Like, I, if I need an antibiotic, I'm taking an antibiotic. I am. But you know what? While I'm taking that antibiotic, you better believe I'm going to be taking my gut protocol and I'm going to be taking everything else that I need to be able to keep things in check. Um, but I also know my body. And if I feel like an ear infection or a sinus infection coming on, I'm going to do those antibacterial, antiviral, antifungal things to help ward it off. But if it gets too bad or it didn't work because the strain's not right or I mistreated it because I misidentified it, then there's an antibiotic there and I'm going to take it. I don't want to because I like my gut in check. I don't like it screwed up, but I will if I have to. There's a balance. It's exactly it. There's a balance. So that is breathing emergencies. I hope I did not overwhelm you, overwhelm you because this is one that is a lot of information. And it's a lot of medical terminology. It's a lot of things that are just like, whoa, what did she say? So if there's things that you were like, wow, that's a lot of information, but your head is spinning a little bit, or you feel like that was a lot of information and you learned a lot, but it's likely that you're going to forget a chunk of it, I'm going to encourage you to go back and watch the replay and take notes, okay? Write lists of what you should have, write lists of what you need to learn, write lists of the herbs so you make sure you keep those in your apothecary shelf. And anything that I mentioned for a tincture, so you can use plantain as a tincture, nettle as a tincture, elecampane as a tincture, mullein and hyssop are best in a tea. Um, make sure you make those tinctures and you keep them there. Like they're shelf stable. They're good. You're making them with alcohol. Remember a tincture is alcohol. It is not a glycerin because that is a glycerite. An olive oil is not a tincture. That is an herbal infused oil. That is a different thing. So a tincture is herbal properties infused into an alcohol. And that is, um, that is a tincture and that is good and shelf stable for a good, good long while. So, if you guys have any other questions, um, definitely send me, like you can you can email me, you can DM me on Instagram, or you can um, put it down in the description and I will still get all of those comments even though we're not live because there's replays and all of the text and everything is available in the replay. So I can definitely get back to you and answer your questions. So does anybody have anything that they wanna ask about while I'm still here? before I pop off. You are very welcome. And yes, I'm sorry about your daughter, Georgette, too. It's it's hard. Oh, she outgrew it? That's fabulous. That's fabulous. My oldest had asthma um, young, like as a baby, and he's 18 now. And it's like the older that he gets, the less issues he has with it. 
Um, now he seems to just like have an issue when he gets sick or sometimes seasonally when his allergies flare, but yeah. Other than that, he doesn't really need to take anything. So it's awesome to watch them grow out of it. It's really hard to deal with them when they're young. It's scary. And it, it just makes you feel so completely like vulnerable and so completely out of control. Like you you can do nothing. Um, but it's, it's good to watch them grow out of it. So super helpful. Thanks so much, Jen. You are very welcome, Paula. All right, guys. I have to call my son back. So <laughs> thanks so much for joining me. And we'll see you guys later. Bye.